в нашем потоке Professional на второй день конференции Коллизиум. Приветствуем наших международных гостей. У нас сегодня МУС Соединенных Штатов, компания Черменко, это Ник Хоббс, легендарная личность, которая работает уже с середины 80-х годов на российском рынке, а также Эрик Дефонтенейт, очень интересный промоутер, который занимается компанией Music Dish в Китае. И сегодня мы узнаем очень интересные актуальные новости из мира музыкальной индустрии, что нас вообще ждет, обсудим, может быть, какие-то интересные новые проекты и узнаем, какая ситуация в разных странах. Everybody welcome. Uh, we're uh, welcome news from United States, uh, Chemenka Music, uh, Nick Hobbs and uh, Eric DeFontaine from China, uh, Music Dish Company. Uh, everybody welcome. How is it going? How, how are you guys? Uh, it's going terribly. <laughs> well, anyway, we're glad to see oh, you come online. Come on, be optimistic, yeah. guys. Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> no, it's a fact. It's going terribly. I'm, I'm you know, personally, I'm fine. But uh, business-wise, it's complete catastrophe. Well, yeah. So, uh, yes. uh, what do you think? Uh, please describe your station in your countries. Uh, Maybe we should start with Nick Hobbs and what's your opinion or what's going on on tours and everything. And what's uh, we're, we're deep in the middle of um, either postponing all our big concerts for this year to next year or canceling them. Those are the two options. None of them are happening. None of the festivals we work with are happening. Everything for the summer is gone. And we think at the moment that even smaller concerts in the autumn and winter might go as well. So uh, generally, it's totally depressing. Uh, we are working, we're doing double work for uh, no money, maybe. Um, and uh, it's, um, uh, and that's the feeling I'm getting, you know, most of the big uh, European festivals have canceled now. Some of, the, some of them, which are in July, August, haven't yet canceled, but they know they will cancel or they expect to cancel. Mm -hmm. And if they cancel, then there's no sense for bands to tour. So all the concerts on the tour go because there's no band. Mm -hmm. um, apart from the fact that at the moment there are so many lockdowns and restrictions and nobody knows exactly how it's going to pan out uh, that uh, it doesn't, you know, even if things changed, you know, if things changed in one country, let's say Germany, where things are a little more under control than they are in the UK or France or Italy, uh, it wouldn't help touring because the bands depend on the whole of Europe. Um, and if they are not touring in, uh, you know, if, they, if their dates have gone in France or the festival has gone in France and the UK and Italy and blah, 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 just having Germany doesn't work for most touring bands mm -hmm. or just having Moscow doesn't work. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, Eric, please describe uh, how, how did it start in China? What was going on there? Wow. Well, China was uh, really an unusual situation because uh, it happened. You have to realize that we, the biggest human migration annually every year is Chinese New Year. About between six to seven hundred million people travel. Uh, most of them travel in the country to go to their family, to go back to their homes. And significant amount of people travel abroad for vacation. It, it's officially a one-week vacation, but it's actually like a two, three-week vacation. Mm -hmm. um, and COVID-19 happened right at the beginning of it. So from our... What was the month? Yeah, it was oh. late January. It was January 26th, I believe, mm -hmm. is when they shut down Wuhan. Mm -hmm. uh, Two days later, I believe they shut down Hubei province. That's the equivalent of 60 million people. Shut down, I mean locked down. Uh, five million people had already left Wuhan, of course. Um, what ended up being like the worst time for this to happen ended up being the best time for it to happen because actually most people, almost everybody was out of work because it was a holiday. They just extended the holiday another week. So we didn't have the unemployment, what I'm seeing in the U.S. Um, 
they were able to contain it in Hubei province. So Hubei was ravaged by coronavirus. Uh, there was also a few other provinces that got hit really hard, but generally the nation as a whole was kind of kept whole. Um, but to my industry, uh, you know, the live music industry is trying is always tricky. And now it's even trickier. So, of course, everything got shut down. Um, there was signs of kind of hope in this in April when they were opening up uh, movie theaters and a certain few venues were announcing new events and etc. And then the government shut it down again because of imported cases of COVID. Um, the first the earliest tour that we have that we're seeing on our radar, and these are domestic tours, is in June. Uh, foreigners are banned from coming into the country. So bringing in overseas bands, we have no idea. Uh, and we did a survey in February of venue owners across the country. And the consensus was most of them might be able to survive until April. Mm -hmm. And now we're mid-April. So this will be crunch time for a lot of venues that work on a, I mean, work on more of a razor thin margin because we have all type of local regulations and et cetera that just doesn't exist. Well, I can talk about America, Rev. Uh, just don't, don't exist in the U.S. So they have additional issues. Uh, so... Yeah, it's, and we don't have like Europe where there are uh, government grants and cultural funds to help support the industry. So we're just basically working off our fumes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the, in the U.S. It's not, it's not much different than that. You know, we have, um, we have a culture that rewards survival of the fittest. And right now, the most fit are the corporations that are already way ahead in the game. So what's happening is you have, uh, you know, Live Nation and AEG, which are the biggest promoters in the country, and, and also um, the the biggest live music companies in the country. They have been uh, talking for quite some time about postponing for one month, then two months, and then for the uh, foreseeable future. And so I think that the uh, issue ends up being when you have thousands of independent venues and promoters that are running day to day or week to week. And a lot of the programs that have been put in place from the government have not addressed the specific needs, neither in the short term or the long term. The short term being how do you uh, pay what, you know, existing bills that you have, whether that's keeping your staff staff covered or uh, your rent paid or your loan obligations or anything like that. And then, of course, the uh, other side of that is long term is even once we are allowed to open up and the venues are allowed to book bands, there's going to be a minimum of a three month rollout before talent is even booked into those, those places. And then you have consumer confidence issues as far as uh, whether or not the, that audience is going to be comfortable buying tickets and comfortable staying in the rooms. It's expected on this side that there's going to be a uh, reverse rollout plan of some kind. So uh, much like they shut down bigger events, and granted it happened quickly from big to small events, but we're expecting to see the same thing here, uh, or limited capacity, or uh, things that would restrict it. So you know, the big festivals, Coachella, it's, it's been, um, you know, pushed back. Uh, you know, the, some of the conferences like South by Southwest and, and you know, have been canceled for the year. And what generally seems to be happening as far as the calendar goes is people are pushing towards the end of the summer. So, you know, September, or October seems to be where folks are, are rebooking a lot of the dates. But there's no real reason to think that that's going to stay put. And, uh, you know, there's other people that are saying it's going to be until the end of 2021 before we start seeing dates back on board. 
I mean, the general feeling in the music industry and the live music industry in particular is that even if venues were able to open today, it's going to be between 12 to 18 months before we retain, we, we regain some type of normalcy, uh, just trying to get tours booked and audience back in rooms and everything else like that. And that's, and that's assuming that the virus is under control. It has nothing to do with the, um, the, the, the contagious nature of what we're all dealing with now. We're just talking about consumer confidence, economic uh, stability, all of those elements. And then when you factor in the lack of answers as far as where the virus is, then it just keeps getting pushed further and further down the road as far as what these answers might be. And we have such an obscene amount of people that are unemployed today, and that number is only going to get worse. So even if we're allowed to book bands and those are allowed to play, it doesn't mean that people have the money to buy those tickets and go out anyway. Mm -hmm. I can give can I, some indication I... from uh, uh, Beijing in 2003, because Beijing was uh, ground zero for SARS in uh, 2003. And if you speak, I was not working China at the time, but if I speak, you know, I've spoken to promoters who were there, and they said it took 12 to 18 months. Yeah. And uh, SARS was really, uh, it came and it went. I mean, it was really contained. It wasn't like COVID. They're talking about a resurgence of COVID coming in November. Yeah. Uh, SARS came and went. It took about 12 to 18 months before the Beijing uh, live scene was what it was before SARS. So we may be looking at 2022, if we're really honest. And that depends on to what, I mean, I, I have a feeling that Asian governments, uh, East, East Asian governments seem to have more of a handle on control. Uh, Europe, so-so, US, not much. So that's gonna be a big determinant also, I think. I think the, I've been, I've spoken to people at both AEG and Live Nation and uh, what I pick up, it's, it's interesting also looking at it from a U.S. point of view, is the uh, Live Nation and AG together have kind of come to an agreement with the main talent agencies, which is uh, WE, uh, uh, what are they called, um, William Morris, uh, CAA, and a, what are the third one? I can't remember. UTA. Uh, hmm? UTA, e UTA yeah, maybe. UTA. Um, and uh, the agreement is quite radical. Uh, for 20, and they've kind of given up on 20 on 2020. Um, they're uh, moving forward on 21 optimistically, but uh, dramatically and dramatically, as in dramatically reducing guarantees, um, so that the risk is no longer uh, on the promoter, but it's on the artist. Uh, the artist gets an uplift on their bonus on their versus deal. So if the show sells out, they might end up making more money than they would have done. But generally, the artist is taking a much, would be taking a much higher level of risk. And AEG and Live Nation can do that because they dominate the American market. So uh, it's not like a tour can just go off, you know, we don't want to work with Live Nation and AEG because they're not offering us an, a sufficient guarantee. We'll go and work with someone else because there kind of isn't somebody else at, that, at a national level. Moose, mm -hmm. we'd agree with that so far. I think that, um, you know, the, uh, the, there's, there's a, 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 I think, a, a slightly misleading aspect to what you're saying. And it's, it's, not, it's not that you said anything wrong. I think it's how the organization is organized. Um, when you're talking about those people being in a, um, an agreement as far as shifting the blame and shifting uh, you know, the uh, 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 impetus towards the artist as opposed, towards, as opposed to towards the promoters, uh, there's other aspects of that that come through as well. Um, one of that is going to be simply the fact that the uh, agents are also working in same parameters. So if the agents are saying that, um, you know, they're willing to work under the terms that Live Nation and AEG are pushing down the road, then they're also forcing those same terms upon the independent promoters and the independent venues that are working across the country, which means all of a sudden you have the shift is... Um, the shift is put more on the uh, the folks that don't have the cash resources to be able to guarantee whether or not a show is going to happen, or uh, or or have the economic confidence to be able to support it. If 
that show doesn't come to fruition, whether it's because the artist couldn't make it into the country, whether it's because the venue wasn't able to open, or any other number of factors. And so when you put this on less of a, an industry giant perspective and more on, I think, the day-to-day -day operational perspective, it affects basically everyone except those five companies in a much more specific and uh, an urgent manner. And uh, you know, Live Nation has gone on the record of saying they have enough access to cash that they could get away without booking a single event for the next 18 months and they'll be fine. And the independent promoters and the and the you know are are looking at a thing of, you know, they're they're the the government programs that have been put into place uh, for us SBA or PPP, which are acronyms that might not mean as much, but essentially to protect the businesses in general, just haven't been disseminated in the way that is helpful to the venues. First, right now, so many of them didn't even uh, get approved for it. And so they're digging into uh, you know the pockets of what they have the ability to do, uh, which is not much. You know some of these are are one or two person owned companies. They're family businesses in many cases. They're um, you know when it comes time to be able to book a show, if an agent is saying that they're going to require ninety percent of the guarantee up front or fifty percent of the guarantee up front, right now that could close a venue. Mm. Yeah, although the model being proposed is actually uh, there's no upfront, there's no there's no guarantee or minimal guarantee. It's so the that, if the, if that were the case, if that actually works like that, and if it works like that for independence as well as the two big ones, um, then it in theory would uh, enable the business to come back online quite quickly. Once, of course, it was actually possible to do that, uh, because the the boat is the same for everyone, obviously. Promoters need to survive. Artists need to survive. Agents, managers, blah, 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 blah. Everybody needs to survive. Um, the, uh, what the, there isn't, I think, in America, in the U.S., um, a promoters, a National Promoters Association. Am I right? Yeah, so we just, we just actually launched uh, the National Independent Venue Association. This is like four days ago it was launched. And Good job. Thank you. And it came, it came out of the work that uh, my company has been doing running independent venue week in the US. So you can hear the very independent slant in how I talk, uh, which is, you know, very natural for me to begin with. But sure. the, um, the, the National Independent Venues uh, Association was started because a lot of these protections just didn't reach that sector of the industry. And nor did it have uh, the, um, the uh, the, the, the safeguards to be able to make sure that they could open. So, Nick, I understand what you're saying as far as, you know, everybody's equal and everybody has the same access, but, but, but they're not starting equally. And, sure. uh, and a lot of the weight within the industry, as things shift and they're shifting quickly, and even that task force that started, you know, those, they started, um, you know, uh, I guess pulling further apart as those conversations went on. But, um, you know, that's, that there's, there's something to be said about an industry-wide task force that doesn't include a large number of the, uh, the people that support the industry, especially on, on a grassroots level, on a groundswell level. Um, so, uh, you know, what we're trying to fight for is to get legislation put into place that helps protect the, um, the, the live industry overall, the venues as part of it, and the people that depend upon it, because the economic, the economic impact of what we, the four of us, are stressing right now, it, it goes into the communities and it goes into the restaurants and the bars and the hotels and everyone else. So we're, we're looking at the, the role as being much more than just how do you save this venue or how do you save this tour, and more along the lines of how do you save these communities across the country? And how do you, how do you uh, help guarantee that they're going to be there in the future? Because I, you know, I think we know that the difference between the, the real uh, publicly traded or multinational companies is they don't have the same local impact and they don't have the same local connections when it comes time to fundraisers for schools or hosting weddings or 
you know, reaching out to the community and, and all the other elements that make a business more than just a business. I, uh, you know, so that's what we're, we're trying to go to DC and, and, and hopefully get written into the next round of legislation. Mm -hmm. I think that the, I know from Eastern Europe that pretty much everybody, my own companies in, included, are forming or part of joined promoter, local pro, promoter associations, national promoter associations, mm -hmm. and are talking direct to government uh, it, with a it, maybe not quite such a socially aware agenda because uh, but still uh, with the agenda of trying to keep the, the promoting ecosystem alive so it's still there when the crisis is over. Um, some of it is covered by general um, schemes which apply to all small businesses which vary from country to country quite a lot uh, like furloughing so you close your office or close part of your office and the state pays a percentage of the, the salary so you can keep the staff, but it's the state paying, not you. Um, and uh, in other countries, there might be direct help for promoters or festivals or venues or whatever in, the, in various forms which are under discussion, which might include tax reductions. We've agreed or part, we've been part of an agreement in, I think, Poland and Czechia where the tax that we paid last year, which was a profitable year, can be uh, offset against the losses this year, which is not how the tax system usually works. Usually the tax system works only forwards. So you, if you make a loss this year, you can offset it against profits next year or in three years time, but you can't offset it against money you already paid to the government because you had a good year last year. So that's something that we've tried to change, which is quite significant, I think. Um, depends on the country. Turkey, there's nothing to help promoters at all. But in Poland and Czechia and Serbia as well, there's something. I don't know yeah. about Russia. No, I think there's nothing in Russia, actually, from what I hear. It's also there's, important, I think, when you're having these discussions to, to identify that there's different reasons to want to keep the, this, this element of the... the the world alive. You know, one is the arts and culture. The other one is the economic impact. The other one is the the local businesses. You know, there's all these different reasons that uh, somebody would be motivated to to uh, invest I don't know. from a from a so government would, perspective, especially. So I would say that. Um, so we're kind of ahead of the curve on COVID. Uh, we just had our first quarter numbers GDP minus 6.8 so that's the first time that china's had a negative quarter since the cultural revolution 1976. Uh, so and the way i'm seeing the u.s having 22 million unemployed people talk about something greater than the great depression one of the things to realize is that the arts can very easily in china very easily but even in other countries be forgotten when you're talking about, and I think people have to realize this, and especially in the industry, you're talking about survival mode. And no one in our generation has known what the word survival mode is. That's probably going back to World War II, the last time people had to face something like that. And so, I mean, that just has to be taken into perspective and people have to take a very long-term view for the industry and actually i believe we have to start reimagining the industry because even as you say uh, even when people come out in beijing uh people life has come back to a certain normal but the malls are still and and this is a very consumerist society the malls are still pretty empty People are going into the parks. They're going outside because they feel safe outside. Um, the government is very reticent to have any gatherings because they don't want, they really want to nip this in the bud. So really you have to think long, long term. And especially for small, and I'm happy that you started the, the association. I think it's called Vina? Neva. Neva, sorry. Because I think really as an association, you have to think of, okay, this is a new world. 
we really have to rethink how are we going to, you know, what are we going to do? How are we going to survive in the long term? And what's going to be the new business model, new economics and stop just throw everything, you know, out the window, say what can work. And that's kind of like, even as a, as a business owner, it's something fortunately probably I was able to figure out sometime in February when I thought, oh, no, we'll, we'll tour bands in Southeast Asia. Oh, we'll do this. We'll do that. And then every avenue, you know, a week later, I found out that avenue shut down, that avenue shut down. Oh, this is completely global. And saying, okay, I have to completely rethink from scratch, just tear my business apart and just rethink it from scratch. Kind of like what uh, dot-coms face in the dot-com crash because uh, we were there during That's that time. That's easier if you have a low overhead, if you don't employ many people. It's really hard if you employ a lot of people. Yes. Um, yes. And uh, you want to keep them because when your business gets back to normal, even if it, you know, to, to next year or something, or even the year after, you uh, want those people to be there. Um, and you have an, a kind of, at least a moral obligation to those people, the people you employ and you've employed for years uh, to try to keep them alive. Uh, not throw them on the dole queue, especially in a country like Turkey, where that's not a very attractive option. Um, and um, so I think it it partly depends on what kind of business you're running. It depends on which country you're in, because countries vary a lot on how they're helping small businesses um, mm -hmm. and particularly how they're helping culture. Some countries, like sort of more Western East European countries, are fairly... Um, active about protecting culture and supporting culture to some degree. It's always politicized. Uh, other countries, which I think certainly applies to Turkey and Russia and probably to China, don't really, you know, they just kind of let culture do its thing and they're not, you know, it's not on their, it's not on their priority list at all. Uh, that's what I understand. Mm -hmm. um, and that's difficult to change because it's a macro political question. Um, and probably to some degree applies in the U.S. as well. Trump is not a cultural chap, obviously. Not just yeah, Trump, but there, there, there's not a, an infrastructure. Europe has infrastructures uh, of grants that are uh, local, that are um, provincial, that are national, Canada, Australia. Uh, the U.S., um, you know, we've never had that infrastructure. So you... I think the problem that, that, that that's facing the U.S. to some extent is even if you want to help that industry, you don't have an infrastructure that is properly calibrated to distribute the funds to that industry, whereas in Europe, you do. You know, you do have uh, minimum performer, uh, performers, minimum wage in France, for example. So you can, you have people's bank accounts. You can shove people, you know, money into people's pockets or festivals or whatever in the U.S., uh, you know. Uh, I think you have to be on Wall Street if you want the government to care about you. Well, that's the, that's the exact answer there. And that, that's what it is, is you do have to be on Wall Street to have the government care about you. And you already have to have those relationships. And that's why, you know, the biggest players in, in the country are less, less worried about it from a public perspective than the independent players. You know, and that's because they, they already have access. And, and let's just pull this back a little bit from the, uh, the touring industry and look at it overall. You know, for us, the headlines are, um, you know, the airlines and Ruth's Chris and, you know, these other uh, very large, very wealthy companies that are getting the money while uh, thousands or millions of, uh, of small businesses are, are not. And so there's a cultural um, blockade, if you will, from a funding perspective, as far as how these, how, how the economy is going to be impacted and where it's going to be felt the most. Um, you know, we have government mandates, government regulations that are closing businesses, but not providing immediate relief. And, uh, and, and that's, I think, the biggest issue that everybody has right here, right? Like, and then you have the, the flip side of that, which is the people that uh, are being uh, encouraged to work, if you will, the essential workers, are also the ones that are coming from the most impoverished uh, you know, communities and, and, you know, you can see the stuff on the news where it's like these, uh, the, the communities are not being hit in the same way. The wealthy communities are able to stay at home. The poor communities are not able to stay at home. Mm -hmm. So you see like there's a very real divide in the U.S. that's happening uh, that's, that's far past just 
what we in our own in our own world want to see as far as being able to go and congregate in rooms and listen to music like the art element is important but the the um i think the uh the the culture of being an american not just right now for the last several decades has been uh very divisive and i think that you know we're we're seeing protests in the street this weekend to open businesses back up uh there's a, a willful ignorance towards what people are and are not willing to uh to tolerate and it's uh it's it's systematic it goes across the board and there's a, there's a there's another point which I thought was maybe just to throw in there, which is um, talking about systematic things in the U.S. The yesterday's concert, virtual concert, Global Citizen, which I watched some of. Uh, yeah, yeah, I watched all, it too. It's really cool. Yeah. Uh, depends on your point of view. They were all stars, um, and uh, the uh, minorities were kind of underrepresented, and certainly minorities artistically weren't underrepresented. There weren't any, so it was uh, mainstream mainstream music of one kind or another, established mainstream music, the top end, uh, the Live Nation AEG end, if you like. Um, and the rest was just not there. Um, and I think that's also uh, indicative or whatever of um, the way it works, not only, of course, in, in, in the US, but uh, globally. Um, and it doesn't help the, the lower so to speak, less commercial, whatever, or more local artists. Um, the whole thing yesterday was not the whole thing, actually, but nearly the whole thing was in English, of course, even though it has the yeah. word global on it. Uh, there was a couple of things in Spanish, I think. I don't think there was anything in French, as far as I can remember. Um, so that's, the, that's a certain kind of uh, portrayal, which is from well-meaning people. I don't, dis I don't uh, impute their, impugn their, their intentions, their good intentions of Lady Gaga or whoever it is. But the way that they think is uh, very much a top-down cultural model, as opposed to a bottom-up cultural model, which is more relevant to any independent. I, I, I fully agree. I don't think it's something that most Americans even think about. Uh, I think that the way that most people perceive Americans is reasonably accurate. Uh, I think there's a reason that we have the stereotype that we have across the world. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not going to change from uh, in, in our current situation. I, I think that anybody who's paying attention to American news from a global perspective will probably understand that. And, uh, and it's, just, it's just where we are right now. Um, I, I, I kind know, of understand. I kind of understand, I mean, I, I remember Live Aid. Uh, I kind of understand where it's coming from because Live Aid was no different. It was, it was a whole bunch of the global names. And the idea is that if you want to attract a global audience, you need to get the top talent. So I'm not going to be, I mean, uh, what I bemoan is it says curated by Lady Gaga. I said, that's not curation. That, I mean, I, anybody could have picked those names. I mean, wow, curation. But I'm not going to bemoan that, oh, if you're going to do a global uh, concert to raise funds for a certain cause, you're going to bring those type of names. The question is, how can we use, that's why I talk about reinventing our industry. How can we use digital technology to be able to reinvigorate causes locally? And that's what, I mean, we're not going to do a global citizen. That's not the role of indie. Who's going to patch in to hear of a band they've never heard of? I'm in China. We haven't heard of most of your bands. My job is actually to bring bands that no one's heard of and to bring an audience to them. And we've had, you know, some success in doing that. So my question is, how can we locally empower people using digital technology and et cetera to get people involved, to get support that's local? Because... If we're going to go and say, oh, well, how can we get the federal government to care when there's a line of airline companies, natural gas companies, oil companies, car companies, hotel companies, and we think we're going to get, we're going to get crumbs. So yeah, that's what I'm saying. There has depends to be on the reading. country. Depends on but, where you are. If you're uh, well, in a country uh, which gives a value, to, a national value to culture in general, then you stand a much better chance and you should even, try. Even, even though I, I agree, I'm French, part French. I agree. We, we, we definitely pride culture. But when, when, when things get pushed to a certain brink, 
and you have X amount of unemployed people and so much budget in the government and cannot raise taxes, choices will be made. And the sure, culture usually is always the, culture and education, they're usually always the first victims of any of these things. I think there's an argument. But, but, but I think Eric, what you're is, talking is, about is very, you're, you're, very, you're very much focusing this, I think, on, on not necessarily specifically Americans, but on what a lot of the political uh, uh, landscape is that has certainly pushed out from the U.S. into many of the other, uh, you know, global leaders. And so I, I think in, in that perspective, I can tell you what's going on here, which is, uh, which is you're right, right? Like you're right and we should be prepared for it. And I think that, that we generally are. Uh, what we're seeing is that the local businesses, the local communities are being supported by their existing uh, consumers and their existing right. audience, right? So, so we're seeing that. And that's true for bakeries. It's true for music venues. Uh, right. People are trying to keep their local companies alive. And, and, well, I shouldn't say they're trying to, but I think people are more aware of the fact that their communities are being impacted because their kids are being laid off and their neighbors right. are being laid off and they're trying to figure out how that works. But then you also have, um, you know, on, a, on a, uh, a global level, the companies that don't have to worry about that are going to weather through it because everything you said, they have access to the, the funding. The real question that we should be asking ourselves here is, uh, are we in a period of complete stunted growth? Or, do, like, in other words, are we only able to maintain the current relationships we have? Or are there uh, options for us to be able to uh, increase that, that reach, whether it's locally or whether it's globally? That, to me, is where I see the ability to innovate is going to discern who's going to be able to make it through this and who's not. If there for is example, support. For example, what would your examples be of possible innovations? Well, I think, I think obviously the shift from, um, you know, a brick and mortar live music venue doing more streaming, right? You know, it's been something that has been possible to do for the last, what, 15 years? Uh, so for the last 15 years, there's been no shortage of companies that have been trying to get people to log in to see whatever club from around the world do a live stream of a concert. The real question has been, who's willing to pay for it? And then where does that money go? So now you all of a sudden have all these different options. Some of them are, are much more widely um, uh, uh, adapted than, adopted than others, like YouTube and Facebook. And then, of course, the, the question is, what's the monetization on that? How does that happen? Then you have your Patreons and your other tip jar elements, Twitch and things like that. And so uh, like, how much money do you have? How much money are you realistically able to make? Are you going to make that money because you have an audience of 2000 now, whereas you would otherwise have played to 100 people in, in some small club? Like, so it's like the, the economics haven't balanced out with what the, 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 the economics. The thing is that people, there's still a qualitative, a major qualitative difference between seeing something live in the flesh and no, seeing it as we're not, uh, we're not arguing seeing that. It, right. And seeing it as that, a live that's stream. Question. And it doesn't matter whether uh, it's uh, a concert or a football match or whatever. It's the same logic. That's another and, question. Uh, but I want to, like, China is the most digitized society on the planet. Um, and we have been doing live streaming actually for several years and monetizing it. Uh, the problem has been uh, in 2017, we actually live streamed each, every band that we brought from abroad. We did a, a in studio or concert live stream. Uh, a lot of those companies that did it either abandoned that segment yeah. or kind of abandoned the, yeah, abandoned that segment. The reason why it was. Why it was profitable, uh, it, you know, it, it is profitable on Taobao, which is the eBay. It is profitable um, in uh, online education. It is profitable in a whole bunch of places. Uh, but it hasn't really been, it's profitable with DJs. That, it, it, recently we found that, uh, because they were forced to. Hasn't proved profitable for live music. And so here I would say yes. Because live music is another beast. It's another animal. Um, and so I, I saw that, I think it's Erica Baidu uh, is trying to, in the States, 
uh, innovate on live stream and monetizing streaming concerts. Um, so that is part of it, but I, the challenge for us is that if, 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 if we're not talking about the big major names, but we're talking about the music I love, independent artists, touring artists, definitely touring artists, they, they do 100 shows a year, but they're not brand names. It is very difficult to, because it's, it's kind of like going from the CD to streaming, right? Even if you're playing for 2,000 people, guess what? You made more selling CDs to 100 people <laughs> than you make now, on Spotify. You have, you have another, you have another like, complication, which is that at the moment in most countries, a band can't get together because of lockdowns and social isolation. So it's impossible for most bands to actually do that unless they're very, you know, high tech set up like the Rolling Stones were last night. But generally a solo performer, singer songwriter, somebody with songs or with a backing track might be able to deal with that. Other yeah. performers are gonna struggle um, at least till the crisis, crisis winds down. But it still doesn't address, I think, the main issue, which is that how do you monetize a live stream in a way that is comparable with a concert? Of course, you can't charge as much for a live stream as you can for a concert, but you have the hope that more people will see it. Um, and uh, the logic is to, can you produce something which is so interesting using the medium itself, uh, not trying just to be um, a concert uh, through a video, which is kind of crap, um, yeah. or uh, but doing something creative with the medium, so that you produce something that you that actually isn't a concert, a, 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 a simply a replacement live concert. Well, I, I mean, mean, I think that's, it, what, that's what Eric's saying, though, is that is that um, you know the, the this is part of that transition that we saw from how people are consuming music to begin with. Uh, and, and, and even though the promise is there and the access is there, that now you can get any band you want from anywhere in the world, uh, when you look at the, the models, it is, it is, I would say, arguably harder to, um, to, to break an artist independently uh, than people would realistically think it is. Because there is so much noise and the, the, the mechanizations from the streaming platforms are still very gated. You still need to know the right people to get in the right place, no matter what's being pushed publicly, uh, it's still very much as a, you have to have success to get success. So the, um, you know, uh, not that the model from 40 years ago where you had <laughs> one radio engine was a better model, but I think the perception there is that anybody can do it. And the reality is, is not everybody can do it. So you have a, a quality gap um, from what's being, uh, you, you know, uh, for people that like music discovery, whether it's uh, smaller unknown bands or regional bands from different parts of the world that just don't necessarily travel in the same way. But Nick, you're completely right. Like there's, there's, there's no answer to this. I think that you know, people in the, in the um, streaming side were really looking at VR and AR uh, as being a potential solution. But, um, but that, you know, and those conversations have been having, there's obviously a bigger buy-in from the fan to be able to do it. Uh, and maybe it will happen. I don't think that anybody thought that some of the poorest neighborhoods in, in the world would have smartphones right now. Uh, but, you know, things are more accessible in many ways. I would say one thing is that, uh, you know, I always say music is the background to our lives. There's music everywhere, but people have always been willing to pay for video. I'm looking at uh, Onwards by Disney and what is it, Troll World. And people are paying like wow, ridiculous amounts for a 48, rent, 48 hour rental. Trust yeah. me, in music, it won't happen, Yeah. right? Because we're the background. Um, well, you so can, you can actually it could be that the concert that is what you're giving away. Like, we've always given away music to make money. It could be that the concert is given away because what people really are interested in is actually what's happening backstage, is actually everything peripheral around the music. And that's what live streaming is taught in China. In China, you don't pay for access. Access is free in live streaming, of course. What you do is you reward people. You gift them digital gifts. And it's the interaction between the live streamer and the audience, which is how you make money. And people are making you know, thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars per month live streaming. 
based on the interaction and the reward that uh, were they doing that before the crisis this is something oh, which has nothing were, to do with the they crisis. were doing that they, they were doing that that this is not uh, this was not innovated in music this was why, and why why did that work in china but doesn't seem to work in anything like the same sort of way anywhere else because uh because china uh it's kind of the legacy problem and so it, you know of course i'm from new york so i think like back then, but I'm also here. Um, so it, it's like we were, I, re, I worked in telecom before, and we were struggling with how can we switch from going from a landline to a mobile? Well, in Africa, there was no, they just went mobile. And they went online banking. And if you look at uh, digital commerce, digital transactions, you know, I never pull out my wallet. I use a mobile phone to pay for everything, fruits and vegetables, everything. In the States, no, because we didn't have the infrastructure of having ATMs. Most people didn't have a bank card, didn't have access to a bank. So you leapfrog. The same thing when it came to live streaming, there was a certain leapfrog. They just, the technology was invented, boom, they found the business models immediately ha has, without has the, the Has the live streaming increased since concerts are no longer possible? It, it has not in the U.S. The statistics in the U.S. have shown that it's actually gone down. Uh, well, I should say, excuse me, let me, let me be more, more accurate. The, um, the, the, the DSPs, the streaming platforms, have shown that their consumption has gone down. Uh, if, you're, if your question is about has live streaming of concerts yeah. um, gone up, I mean, I think that we can all anecdotally look at what's around us and say, of course it has, right? You, you know, it's just, what's a concert? That's, that's what's changed. You're no longer putting a camera up in a venue and getting that one single shot. You're now in somebody's living room and, and you're seeing their, their grand piano because they have the money. Um, so that's, that's what's different. I mean, we've seen some venues in the States have done uh, like closed door concerts, like the Rebel Lounge in Arizona had Jimmy Eat World uh, performing there, just a, a mic stand and nothing else. But, um, you know, to put a full band on together, you're kind of creating a different problem. And that's what people are trying to avoid doing. So what sure. good does it do to put a band together if all of a sudden everyone gets sick the next week? Yeah, but the, the, the live streaming that you're talking about does have you know, smaller bands, independent bands, alternative bands, underground bands or artists, whatever. Have they been doing the same thing with, a, with, a, with some success or it doesn't work for them? So in China, I mean, the problem has been getting bands together. Uh, there was one band stolen that was able to do a, a actual concert. And they're, they're a pretty big indie band. They toured with New Order in uh, Europe uh, last year. Uh, they were able to do a live stream concert, all the band members together in a venue, so more proper concert. It did quite well. Um, so there is possibilities for that. I think it did quite well also because it's an environment where there was a scarcity of anything. So otherwise, what you've seen is at-home festivals, where you've seen old footage of festivals being shown and et cetera. Um, live streaming itself has boomed in China because live streamers don't require all the pieces to create a live stream. It's a person. In our case, we need to have a drummer, a bass player, a guitar player, and whatever other vocalist and whatever other people to come on the stage, have lights, and et cetera, to do a show. So... How is live streaming now happening and how will it happen when COVID is over? Will it become a new business model is kind of the question. To me, while we're under lockdown, we're under lockdown. There is not like a lot of new business models. But we you have still have down. artists. But you still have artists, as we saw yesterday with Global Citizen, some artists are able to perform solo from their home with a piano or a guitar or whatever. Right, but there's no, mechanism, there's no mechanism for, there's not a very good mechanism for monetization, especially in the West. In China, more so, but in the West, really not a very good mechan mechanism, uh, sorry, mechanism for monetizing that. So and why couldn't you, why couldn't, it, why doesn't it work selling tickets? for a virtual concert, uh, which might combine several artists to make it into a kind of proper bill, um, and uh, where the tickets are marketed and sold through perhaps regular ticketing companies, 
by a regular promoter uh, who is paying the artists in some way or other, either a percentage or including a guarantee or whatever. And they were coming up to the crunch for their venue. And, you know, for various reasons in Asian cultures, crowdfunding doesn't work because it's viewed like you're begging. You yeah. lose face. But Jodai had no choice. So they went to their audience and said, look, we need your help. And what they did is a two for one credit. Whatever you donate to us, we're going to give you credit for twice the value. Um, it was a huge success. And the reason why is because Jodai nurtured a community and values. And so one of the things is companies that before uh, have access to capital like Live Nation and AEG, yes, they'll survive. The other ones are the ones that really were nurturing a sense of community and a culture and values. And those companies can survive and need to learn how to tap into their audience. Some will not survive because they did not do that. And just how, how do basically... You, let me just take, give, me, give a scenario, a simple scenario. You're an independent promoter or you're a club or you're maybe a theater or whatever kind of independent venue. You're not owned by anybody. You're, you know, it's self-funded, everything. So you're in deep trouble because your income has disappeared for so far a month and probably for another four, five, six months or whatever. The, what are the options which are available to you as in that category, which is most of us, I think, to, to do what you're suggesting, which I think is totally wonderful, but I don't quite understand how I could do that with my business, for example, maybe because well, I'm just I, I stupid. Think, you know, what Eric said is, is part of that is cultural, right? Because in the U.S., um, you know, the idea of doing a GoFundMe, a crowdfunded, um, you know, life, life preserver is, uh, is how we get health care. Right. So, I mean, not not to sound dismissive of it, but, uh, you know, if you're in trouble, you you put this website up and you say, please help. I'm in trouble. Um, Dude, you're really making the U.S. look bad. <laughs> that's <it's>, health care. <laughs> it's, it's, um, but, but I mean, that's also part you're right, of right, you're as far right. as, like even even keeping your employees paid. Right. It's not just a matter of having your employees being able to. Uh, to cover their costs, it's because insurance is tied into uh, to, to your employment here. And so, uh, you know, there have been hundreds of independent venues that have done crowdfunding. Uh, and, uh, and on Independent Venue Week's website, you know, we, we started listing them right away. Uh, and you can see that some of these have raised tens of thousands of dollars, and that's what they need. Others have, uh, you, you know, the majority of the venues that are doing these are doing them specifically to help their staff, right? So it's almost like tipping the bartender. And some of them are being more creative. They're doing things like what but, Eric said. But that, I can understand that working for a venue because a venue is a local thing. People who are living there go there. And if it's a nice yeah. venue with a nice vibe, then people feel uh, some responsibility for its uh, future, for its continuance, et cetera, et cetera. But does that apply to um, other kinds of venues which are maybe not so local in their in their profile or promoters who are kind of like the people who put the thing on, but who are not particularly having a personal relationship with their audience. I mean, of course, they buy tickets. They kind of know who they're buying it from, but they don't really care too much because they want to go and see Artist X. And whether it's Live Nation or an independent promoter who sells those tickets doesn't make any difference. Well, that's I can where say from, I, I can see like, a, a local business and people that actually connect yeah. because, you know, first of all, these, these mailing lists are in the hundreds of thousands, right? So it's like sending an email out, you might only get a few hundred people that, that, that opt in, but they're going to be people that, that uh, are, are in your corner. And um, I think that is the difference between being a no name, uh, blind company on the bottom of your credit card slip versus something that you trust to curate shows and to bring you something cool and to, be that tastemaker because, you know, in my, in, in, when I was growing up, I would flip to the back of the weekly magazine and I would see the same print ads for the same venues. And that's where I would get info. So there's no difference between, you know, what's happening now is it's, you're just going to different print ads and it happens to be on the Facebook pages or Twitter accounts. It's, you're, would, it's an alliance. I would say that like my advice was really kind of to, uh, 
promoter and as a promoter myself in China, I think we have developed a certain uh, brand around bringing very unusual, risque, high quality music that people go, oh, you got to show what is it? I want to see it because you bring something that's totally different. So if you've tried to build a brand, I'm talking to somewhat, you know, the, the people who are promoters now, they've already rolled their dice. Either they've developed that community thing or they were faceless. Yeah. I'm talking to the future promoters because a lot of, I, I remember the dot-com crash and a lot of the people, they lost the business, the bit, devastation. And then there was a whole crop of new businesses that learned from the the old businesses. So I'm kind of talking to the new, to the, there, there the, are the two people. Kinds of, two kinds of promoters, maybe roughly. One is the niche promoter who promotes uh, maybe only jazz or world music or both, or maybe only electronica or whatever. And then there's the general promoter who promotes whatever they think can sell tickets, basically, at whatever level. It might be a club level or it might be an arena level. Sure. sure. Um, and um, most of the business is the second category, let's say. Most of the business is promoters who are not necessary, and that's excluding Live Nation and AEG, but most of the business, yeah, 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 apart yeah. from yeah. those two, is made up of promoters who are trying to run a business or have been trying to run a business, um, which means they have the flexibility to do a club show or a theater show or an arena show, whatever. And they have different relationships with different artists, which might be include some great artists and might some include some who are kind of rubbish. Um, right. And uh, that's the life of, that used to be the model, I think, for most promoters, in my experience, and certainly talking about myself, not necessarily out of choice, um, you know, I might be much happier if I only promoted Arcade Fire and Nick Cave and Midlake and, you know, bands that I lo love. Uh, but that's not the commercial reality that I find I found myself in. I found myself mm -hmm. in a reality where I had to compete with Live Nation and AEG or Live Nation in particular in Eastern Europe um, or I wouldn't survive. Simple as that. Yeah, you know, in the U.S., though, I think a lot of the people that you're Gu guys, sorry. Um... I just wanted to interrupt you for uh, one reason. We have top your chorus and uh, top your. Uh, please join our con conversation because we're really interested in uh, what's going on in Finland as well. So, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I, I'm on, on <laughs> mute when I'm don't have any anything clever to say. I think it's it's better for everyone to to use the mute mute there. But I mean, in Finland, we 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 are facing the uh, the problem with with all the summer festivals maybe getting cancelled, but uh, there's no official official uh, uh, law or anything uh, so yet. So uh, all the promoters are are having a hard time because they still are working to do those festivals, and you know the the longer it stays in this kind of limbo situation, the worse. The, the festivals will will have it. I mean, it looks very likely that uh, all the festivals in in June will be cancelled, but they haven't been officially cancelled by anyone. It's the insurance things because if the, I think here it's it's very important to know, uh, you know, that don't freak out too early. You know, if you are a promoter, you know, wait until there's some official cancellation then you you can use the force majeure and 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 you don't lose so much money but now all the promoters you know they they have no clue if they can do the festival even in 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 late late july or august you know it's it's really really tough you know Tapio, i think we we saw in the u.s that that everybody was assuming that would be the same case and i realize we have different laws than you do but the insurance companies are saying that this is not force majeure. It's uh, it's related to pandemic. So unless you have pandemic insurance, which very few people do, the insurance is not going to, to cover it. And there's obviously a number of different um, lobbying firms that are trying to get the government to force that hand. Um, but uh, it, but the I what we saw. And we should have taken a better a better uh, look at what China was doing and what, what happened in China from an American side. And I know you were very much affected by South by as well, waiting as long as they, they did. Um, but had they canceled it earlier, it wouldn't have been accepted. 
Um, and I think what we're seeing on the reality is that, that the further in, in advance you can cancel the events, the better off it is for everybody who's involved in them. The better off for uh, the I, artists, I for the agree. fans. It's not only canceling events. Now, it's not only canceling events because mostly the events are rescheduling the artists that they booked for this year to next year because they've done the work of booking the artists. They have a loyalty, an obligation kind of, and they want anyway those artists. Those are the artists that they had in their on their bill. So then they have to reschedule the 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 whole fest, the whole event to the following year. But of course, the way touring tour scheduling works is it's never neat. So what worked this year doesn't necessarily work next year for a touring band. The same routing doesn't necessarily work. So it gets very complicated and it's a lot of extra work, of course. It's not just like you send an email, oh, the concert's canceled, send us back the advance and we'll survive. Um, and the other issue on insurance is I think in Europe, almost nobody was insured for epidemics, almost nobody. There were some people who were insured and the insurance had to be taken out last year. It couldn't be taken out this year because, of course, insurers will not insure for something which already exists. So if a few promoters, I can think of one, um, and one sports event, Wimbledon, had uh, an epidemic insurance, more or less everybody didn't think about it and didn't have it because it was a buyback as an extra cost and nobody thought it was you know, remotely likely. So uh, most people are not insured. So if they get compensated, they get compensated by their governments or they just lose money. Yeah, I wasn't so much referring to, to getting, getting uh, money from the insurance companies against the losses of, of, of canceling the festival. I'm talking about more like the festival uh, artist relationship and if the advances have been paid, you know, it, it might work in those kind of uh, force majeure situations, if you can, uh, you know, negotiate with the agent or... or, or... I, I, I've, I've postponed so far at least 50, uh, 50 artists, maybe more, probably more actually, more like 70 to next year. Every agent so far has returned the advance or at least credits the advance for the following year. So nobody has taken the money. Yeah. That's great. Um, and I, th I think that's the general line in the business, because obviously, otherwise, we'd all be broke. We'd all be out of business. We wouldn't be able to refund the punters who want their money back, et cetera, et cetera. It would be just complete disaster. And I know of one case uh, where I don't think I can say the name of the artist, but he's German. Um, and he his agent didn't want to refund the money. And these were for Russian concerts in particular. But he insisted that the agent did refund the money. So I think that's the general ethos. Um, and um, uh, so that's the that uh, kind of uh, nuclear scenario isn't happening. What is happening is that the, the artist side goes, we will eat our costs, we'll return the advances, but you have to, as a promoter, eat your costs or be insured for them, because which, of course, nobody was. Um, so that's a sort of fair balance, but it doesn't solve the problem for the promoter. For the artist, it's a little easier because they can just cancel the tour and they don't have any costs uh, as long as they weren't in the, already in the middle of the tour. And mostly yeah. March is not a big touring season. So mostly artists, at whatever level, they weren't in the middle of a tour somewhere, but mostly they weren't. Um, so it's the summer that's gone. Um, and those artists were able to pull back their costs, cancel their you know, bookings for vehicles and whatever else. Um, and uh, are probably in a reasonably good, they're not going to make any money this year, but they're not necessarily going to lose much. Whereas the promoter um, still has their overhead. They can't cut that so easily um, and is uh, all, will have already have had costs for the events that were underway as well, uh, venues that were booked and so on. But again, most venues are returning all the deposits and most, there's an argument with ticket companies where, because when you have to refund the ticket, Normally, the ticketing company will still keep their commission. Uh, and in this, in, for Corona, some ticketing companies, or maybe most ticketing companies, are also refunding the commission to the promoter. So the promoter does, isn't out of pocket. But some ticketing companies are saying, no, we'll keep the commission. And uh, if you're talking about you know, a, a significant concert, uh, the ticketing commission is 8% or 10% or whatever it is, that's a lot of money which they, the promoter wouldn't get back in that scenario. But Nick, I think like what you're talking about is um, it's, uh, 
You know, it's possible to be an artist and be perceived successful and not make a single dollar in profit, right? You know, I think people forget that. It's um, your your ability to do that as a promoter is uh, going to be one, maybe two shows unless you come from money yourself, because the whole purpose of being a promoter is to reinvest that money uh, down the road. And um, but I think as far as cultural sympathy, promoters are going to get a lot less of it because they're 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 looked at as a a, a gear, a, a tool within the process uh, of that. And certainly a lot of what what I've been seeing from public support has been for the artists because they're not going to necessarily make the money and they and they should get the public support. You know, artists should continue sure, to get. Of course, support. everybody should. Um, but the artist has other income streams. The artist doesn't just depend on live. So they also have money from publishing, from streaming. They can also go out and they can say, okay, I'll sit at home and write a new album. I mean, there's, it's kind of a different situation. It's not I directly totally comparable. I, to I totally agree. And, and I think that that's what, what, what people need to understand is that it is, it is in the artist's best interest to be able to see these promoters in business next year. Um, certainly, if they're promoters that they enjoy working with, as we all know, this industry is full of people that none of us enjoy working with. Um, but, uh, but you know, it's an artist's in, in, in best interest. It's in the record label's best interest. It's in the PRO's best interest. It's in everybody's best interest to be able to continue to make sure that there's a, a stage to perform on this time next year. Uh, you know that, and 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 I know that sounds very basic and very simple, but there's there's not the same type of safety net. Um, in uh, a, a culturally symp sympathetic way for the venues and the promoters that are putting these shows on on a regular basis. Because like you said earlier, Nick, I don't think a lot of people necessarily uh, make the connection. They're following the artists. But the people that do make the connection are more likely to be able to show support. So when it comes time to lobbying your government or supporting fundraisers or any of those types of things, this is going to be where that existing relationship needs to be leveraged. And this is going to be where, where you find out who your friends are, right? You're going to find out who really is in your corner in a situation like this. Yeah. I, there, one other thing I would say is that it's not only the promoters and venues. It's also all the support crew. It's the trucking yeah. companies, the hospitality yeah. companies, the technicians, the PA companies, the lighting companies, blah, 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 blah. The, the security companies, the people who work at the venues, et cetera. There's a whole bunch of, of service companies who are usually freelance. They're yeah. not actually on this venue or promoters uh, mm -hmm. payroll. But they're an essential part of the overall a, live ecosystem. A very easy simplification on my part for the sake of the conversation. I, I totally agree. Yeah, me too. I mean, think about South by Southwest. How many thousands of people in Austin are depending on 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 the you know all the all the work they uh, do around that you know like uh, catering companies and all that and and technical crews and 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 all that. They they have and most of them are are kind of running companies so for them uh, you know this unemployment thing is it's much harder you know than than uh, of course it, it's a cash flow thing also for the artist but they can still you know maybe maybe get some income from uh, you know airplay and 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 so on so you know they they will of course uh, you know have a hard time too if they have just bought a new house or something and they need to do like monthly payments to their bank and and but in general it's these small service companies i think that are are getting hit the hardest and the smaller artists the artists who are what you could call working touring perpetually touring artists who don't make much money any other way which is a lot of niche a lot of niches, including classical and jazz and world and, you know, lots of niches where the artists de really depend on their live income, but they're not stars. We're really talking about most independent artists. Yeah. If anybody looks at what streaming is, um, we're talking about most independent artists. Yeah. And even, even depend on touring to be able to bolster other revenue sources. Um, I mean, when they're doing an album release, they're planning six months and the tour is actually what's going to gener help generate or invigorate those other revenue channels. Yeah, it's, it's a huge amount of artists, but I mean, when you start talking about percentages, it's not the majority of the artists that are, that are touring, right? You know, like it is, it, there was that study that uh, CMU released whose exact name I can't remember off the top of my head, but um, 
they, they had basically split all the different artists into nine or ten different tiers. And, uh, you know, the earlier tiers are not necessarily profitable as much as it is they're the ones that we all just assume are profitable because we see them everywhere. Uh, but that money gets reinvested so quickly. And uh, whether it's the plane tickets or to commissions or uh, any number of different places. And, uh, and those are the people that uh, essentially had a very, um, Nick, to your, you're right. It's like not only did they not necessarily lose as much because they're not renting, um, you know, semi-trailers and, uh, and, and chartering they planes and all overhead. those up. Right. But, but, there, but it also, I would argue, it means that the money that they have spent is that much more valuable because them losing six thousand uh, dollars through things that they might not get back is potentially the difference between them being able to to eat that year i think the problem is different if you have an overhead if you yeah. employ people you're in big trouble because you have no income to pay those salaries or your office rent or whatever else is included in your overhead if you're an artist where basically apart from your manager uh, and he's he she or he is on percentage anyway everybody is freelance more or less i mean the big artists of course employ some permanent crew, permanent staff but it's very few you know even big name artists might employ five people at the most to run their office uh, and those are the stars who can afford anything but most smaller artists they don't employ anybody they are just the artists the four people in the band or whoever it is so they can cut back their overhead by not spending anything. So of course they won't have any money to eat. So then they depend on social security or whatever provisions the government might make, which in France might be quite good or Finland yeah. might be quite good. Uh, but I think they're in a better position than a promoter who, or a venue, same deal in fact, because venues have quite big in-house staff yeah. usually. Uh, and those, those are the people who are really suffering most, it seems to me anyway. And with festivals, it's, it's somewhere in between because festivals tend to have a, have a central staff, which might be 20 or 30 people. And then they, they hire tons of people for the event itself who are all freelancers. Yeah. So their problem will still be to pay for that 20 or 30 people. Yeah, I, I think uh, for local artists, local big names in, in a country like Finland, they can reschedule quite easily and uh, because it's not, you know, when they, they play locally, it's not part of an international tour. So for them rescheduling, I mean, autumn will, will be so busy, it's, it's that the market will be totally saturated. If people still have money in the autumn, you know, uh, everyone will s suffer only because there's so much live music happening, you know, like seven days a week, and uh, all the venues, because everyone has now rescheduled, most of them until autumn, some of them already until next spring, which might be wiser anyway. But the touring artists that have like international tours, and that's why the festivals are um, you know, they, they, it's not going to be easy for them to reschedule for next year with the same same lineup because there's so many variables. But like, I was uh, forced to cancel four shows by a Dutch band in last week of March, and I could reschedule two of the shows to the autumn. And hardly anyone from the people who had bought the tickets wanted to get their money back. They were, you know, so so. People, if you have a band that has loyal fans and it's a, like a one-off, they come from Holland only to play a couple of shows in Finland, it's not a huge problem. But if it's part of a tour, you know, then it's totally different. I think the exper experience Let me tell you something that... Let me just say something about the ticket refunds things. Glastonbury, which has an incredibly loyal audience, it sells out in one day or less than a day every year, guaranteed, whatever it is. One third of the ticket buyers requested a refund after it was cancelled for this year. One third. Really? Yeah. Um, and that, I think, from what I understand, is quite common for festivals. Because festival tickets are like 200 euros or maybe more. Uh, people are worried about their income. Um, and their first uh, priority right now is survival themselves. So uh, if it's a smaller act, and, it, and, the, and the other thing that's a factor is how long the postponement is. If you're postponing from the spring to this autumn, that's not very long. 
if you're postponing from this spring to spring in a year's time, that feels quite long, long. For, a, a, for a punter. So I think those, there are quite a lot of variations in that. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to also yeah, say right. that yeah. I think you have to, we have to think of we're going to be entering a post-COVID world. So maybe because I started this COVID thing in January, so for me, it's been over three months that we've been dealing with this. And something dawned on me relatively recently. Is this the end of the era of cheap international flying? The, this for me is a huge thing because the whole world was calibrated to relatively cheap flying for international brands and we bring them to China. Whether it's from Europe, whether it's from the US, if you have the right time, time schedule and et cetera, uh, it was relatively cheap to bring a band from Finland, for example, uh, which had a priority of being a European hub to China. Uh, it was relatively cheap to bring a band from Finland to China, which really helped with international touring. The airline industries are in a complete utter mess. How many will be around, et cetera, I don't know. Um, if you want to come to China, you have to do two weeks quarantine. How long will that last? Actually, if you're, if you're a foreigner, you, you can't come to China at the moment. How long will that last? How is that going to evolve for other countries? There's, you know, I think there's some interesting things about the airline thing, which affects touring anyway. One is that the planes exist. So if an airline goes bankrupt, the first thing they do, somebody does, the creditors, is they try and sell the planes. And even if they have to sell them at a cheap, super cheap price, they'd rather sell them than have them sitting in a, on a, on a, you know, in an airport somewhere growing old. So the planes are still there. It affects new orders for planes to the manufacturers, but the planes no, 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 it, carry on no, no, existing. It, it, no, 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 it affects. So I think, no, no, no. It, it, I what think, you're assuming is that demand picks up. Everybody has this discussion there. where they there. assume, oh, well, when we go back to normal, there's planes there. We may but, not need half those planes because people a, are not going to fly and the, the, the price points of a flight may be very different, which is going to affect demand. So those planes, actually, there may be a, like, there's a glut of oil right now, not because of COVID, mostly because of a price war between Russia and, and Saudi Arabia to undermine American shale. But there's, that's a perfect example. There's a glut of oil. They have just reduced production of oil, and it had almost no impact on price. And I'm going to, like, transfer that to airlines. Uh, except in the reverse, where airlines are like, no, we have to charge more because we have to start refilling our coffers. Cheap but but that's, a, that's always a market thing. Airlines operate in a very competitive market. And so they, their pricing, like in fact, a bit like concert tickets, is set by the market. It's not set by how much money you can make or won't make or whatever. You have to set it by the market. If people won't buy, buy at a certain price, even though you think you need that price or you do need that price, you still can't sell at that price. You have to sell at the price that people will pay, no, pay for. At the moment, the airlines have two, before it was only price. Now they have two variables. How many routes do I reinitialize? 90% of routes are shut down. So now, do I go back to 100% from 10% or do I go back to 50%? So sure. it's literally rebalancing supply and demand. So it could be that supply is 60% of what it was before, demand is 70%, and therefore prices are twice as much Eric, as I feel before. That, I think that what you're, what, 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 you're, what you're talking about may or may not happen, but I think it's also, uh, it's important to, to have, you know, speculation on both a, a conservative aspect and of course also in a more panic-inducing aspect. Um, you know, what, what the reality is, is everything that we have used and have known has changed and will continue to change. And, uh, you know, I think, Tapio, what you said as far as shows being booked for the fall of this year, for the autumn of this year, to me, that just sounds absolutely insane. You know, like we're seeing it, we're seeing it as well here with, with venues because I think largely they feel they have to rebook something. You can't leave it empty. But we're telling our, our international clients that are looking to tour the U.S., even if it were to open in October or November, there's 
there's going to be such a traffic jam of artists that want to perform. And I think that November and October might even be a little bit too optimistic, but I think that there's going to be such a traffic jam that if you're a new artist and you're trying to get into the market, you're going to have all of the issues that Eric just talked about as the airlines try to make their money back. You're going to have all the issues that, you know, Nick was talking about as far as being able to uh, have too many people trying to play the same rooms. You know, you're going to have all of these issues all at once. The reality is, is we don't know. We just need to be kind of flexible and open enough to be able to navigate as, as these opportunities come up in front of us. I think that the airlines thing, I don't know. For me, it's a bit of a distraction because the biggest markets are regional. So there's a European market, which doesn't depend very much on airlines. It depends on road transport, the same as North America. Um, I don't know about Southeast Asia or South Asia, um, but the, the, certainly in Europe, the airlines, I don't think it's a major issue on touring, except, of course, for American bands or Australian bands coming into Europe. The bigger ones, they'll just absorb the cost. The smaller ones might suffer. Uh, that's what what's interesting. Interesting. Guy, guy, guys, sorry, we have 10 minutes left and uh, we have one question from YouTube. Uh, Just one? Uh, uh, well, the first one was uh, the question to anyone, uh, to everybody. Uh, uh, do you think the audience will be having fear and some kind of mistrust to visit big shows in Venice uh, if we're talking uh, uh, even about uh, next year? Yeah, I, I think it's inevitable. Uh, I think it's inevitable, and I think that the um, what we're going to see is we're going to see a uh, a relearning, if you will, of how to behave in public, and that relearning is going to come uh, it, it, in the entertainment sector. If you're talking about you know like clubs to larger rooms to theaters to arenas, etc., that's going to be part of it. But also look at it from a sports perspective. Are you just going to have thirty thousand people in a, in a stadium now to see a football match? I, I can't imagine that's you're just going to get an all clear from the government and people are going to swarm out. So I, I think that there will be a um, a cultural relearning across the world as far as what people are and are not comfortable with. There's an interesting issue with seated venues versus standing venues. Seated venues, you can do stuff like a block off every alternative seat. So you can have social distancing quite easily in a seated venue and a standing venue. That doesn't work because people will move to the front. So even if you only have half capacity in a standing venue, the back half will be empty, the front will be full. Generally, that's how people behave at a concert. Um, the issue of whether the concert, and the same, of course, for a festival, the, the issue of whether people will be afraid depends. You know, that's, that's one of those big unknowns because nobody, mm -hmm. nobody knows now how this thing is going to pan out, fade away whether there'll be reprieves, whether there'll be a vaccine or a treatment or nothing, or it's, you know, who knows? I would say uh, the thing I'm worried about the most here in China is uh, the restrictions placed by local government. So will they say you can only sell 50% of capacity or 40% of capacity or 30% of capacity, which will affect my profitability and whether, I can do, whether it's worth me doing the show. Uh, if I go beyond that, uh, what we have seen is, uh, whereas live has not opened, clubs have reopened in China. And the interesting thing, uh, Arkham in Shanghai was one of the first clubs to open. And everybody had to be in their, they, they said, you know, like, a, one meter square area to, for you to dance. And then another person had to be a one square, meter, one square meter area to dance. Another person, one square me area meter to dance. And it was really interesting and, and being enforced by the club. Um, as for the people, I don't know. On the one That's hand... My dream scenario, by the way, Eric, is that nobody's around me. I just get to <laughs> in space. My, my opinion is... Not sure it will work the, in other the, countries. It's interesting that it worked in yeah, China. Chi in, in China, yeah, I mean, we'll follow the rules. Uh, my thing that's interesting is I see like two pools, and, and maybe they're cultural within countries. Uh, people, there, there's the idea that, uh, after, you know, people are already fed up in the U.S. They're already Everywhere. congregating. They're already con no, no, no. I think the U.S. is quite exceptional. Oh, it's They're already congregating the protest. And uh, you those know. are nutcases. Those are the. Those oh are the, no, no, no! You don't know the. Dude, I'm American. Those are not nutcases. Those are like 
fifty percent of the population of America. And I, I'm telling you, New Yorkers are just a little more civilized. But you know, as soon as they're told you can go out, some of them are going to have this hankering to do it. I don't know. So in Asia, we have a different experience than the rest of the world again because we had SARS. So why does everybody wear a mask in, in, in Asia, East Asia? Because we had SARS. That's why. That's why we don't have a retinue to wear masks, because we already had something that was very deadly. So the U.S. and Europe will be very different from Asia. Will people be like, all right, go. Yes. Well, I don't know anybody who had COVID, so it's cool. You know, it's not that bad. That's what you're seeing in Michigan or Florida well, you or don't, whatever. It's, more, it's not about people having COVID. It's about people who died from COVID. So if you don't know anybody who died from COVID, then you're yeah, yeah, the yeah, optimistic. Yeah. Or, or had a really bad situation with COVID. Yeah. I would say. There's yeah. one point I'd like to just say before we close, which is that the national touring will open up probably before international touring. So Finnish artists touring in Finland or Russian artists touring in Russia or whatever is much more likely to start before uh, artists can cross borders. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, and, and if I were a promoter, my focus would be for this year totally on national artists if I was going to do anything at all. Nick, that's exactly what we're doing here in China. And we were completely focused on international artists up until this year. And that's what I mean by flexibility. Right. So, guys, uh, I think we should uh, finish uh, our conference. Okay. And so, yeah, we have like three or four minutes yeah. if uh, we have enough time. There's one question from YouTube. <clears throat> what ways would you recommend to work with local governments for middle range festivals to get funding? Uh, to be able to float on uh, uh, for one empty year, uh, for example, German approach, which seems to work uh, for 100%. Work together. Work th form an association of, of all the festivals in the country if there isn't one. And approach government together with one voice. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what we're doing in the US. That's what we created the uh, National Independent Venue Association for. Uh, it's, it's exactly what Nick said. Mm -hmm. I would add one but, but thing. In, in, the, in the US, just one thing. Presumably, it's a bit, you have two kind of levels, though. You have a state level and you have a federal level. So you might have an association at a state level and you might have another association at a federal level. Am I right? Yeah, correct. And we, and we are working with a lot of those state and regional uh, offices. But the reality of it is the state is not going to have the same access to funds. I would add one thing that we've learned in China, uh, businesses that are in the balance back that are doing well are businesses that really reinvested, double down on their interaction with their clients, with their audience. So if you are a festival, don't be silent. If you have a mailing list, get in touch with them. Uh, rebroadcast old festival footage. Uh, do whatever you can to keep that link with your customer. And everybody's going to have to do that during this COVID period. And in China, actually, I think companies were very proactive, and that was their solution. <laughs> Build my brand. And so I would say festivals have. And in this way, you can maybe uh, ensure if you keep that connection. Uh, to retain that brand loyalty so that when you are able to get back on, you're able to sell good tickets and maybe surmount some of the trust issues that we were talking about before. If a festival can talk about what are they doing to mitigate risk from COVID virus, it will make people going to the festival feel more comfortable. Oh, there's going to be plenty of masks and there's going to be things to wash and there's going to be this they're going to feel a lot more comfortable, but it's only if you communicate to your customers, whether it's a promoter, a venue, maybe not an artist, like a festival, communication is going to be huge. And it's going to make the difference from our experience here as to how much trust and how much people want to kind of invest in you. Thank you for your, for your answer, and uh, I really appreciate everybody for joining our conference today, and uh, we need to go to another one. So thank you guys for having us.
thank you for joining and for the comments on YouTube. So uh, let's keep in touch and we're really glad to see everybody again. I would, I would love to do another one in two or three or even four, four weeks time. I think it was yeah, really good. Yeah, 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 let's do it. Let's do it soon. Thanks, Thank Vladimir, you, Carl, Sergey, thanks. and everyone, Eric, uh, Nick, uh, Moose. It was Thank a pleasure. You. Yeah. Thank Take you, care. Coliseum, no, for putting this together. Yes. Thank you, Vlad. Thank you. Nice. Thank you, guys. Kasiba. Yeah. See you. See you in two weeks. Right. Okay. See you. Okay. новые направления, новые интересы и людей. Здесь это площадка, когда люди могут наконец-таки встретиться офлайн, пожать друг другу руки, обняться и обсудить какие-то новости и выстроить планы дальнейшего развития совместно. Коллизиум — это прекрасная площадка, где собирается профессиональная индустрия, где собираются те люди, ради которых, в интересах которых мы, собственно, творим и работаем. Это мероприятие для менеджеров, для тех, кто устраивает концерты. Я приехал сюда именно в надежде Возможно, встретить какого-то менеджера, возможно, встретить какого-то продюсера. Всегда надо шевелиться, всегда надо что-то делать. Когда меня сюда пригласили, я посмотрел свое расписание, этот уикенд у меня свободно. Я думал, почему не поехать в любимый город Петербург? Вы знаете, 10-й юбилейный, страшно вообще сказать. 10 лет прошло, а коллизиум все существует. Тогда мне казалось, что действительно не так много внимания уделяется академической музыке, не очень много внимания уделяется джазу. А это важно. Я думаю, что аудитория выросла, которая это действительно важно и нужно. И, по-моему, то, что есть классич... панель, связанная с классической музыкой в этом году, это хорошо. Была благодарная аудитория. Мне кажется, неплохая была атмосфера. Я сказал все, что я хотел. Все, что меня спросили, я все ответил. Я сказал, я думаю, что аудитория меня услышала, те, кто хотел. Я обещал прийти в коллизию, я пришел.